Shalom, Jim. How are you? Shalom, Rabbi. Doing very well, Baruch Hashem. I hope you're doing okay. Thank God. Uh, good. To, yeah, amen. Um, I'm so happy so to see you. So here we are. I'm always happy. At my age, I'm happy to be seen, as I like to tell my friends. So <laughs> there, There's that By age the way, issue again. Yeah, I know. It's, uh, I'm, I'm committing ageism on myself. I think that's what it was. They call it Listen, ageism. I've been thinking about you. And yes. I've, been, I've been waiting to talk to you because I noticed the past few days that King Tut has been in the news. A tremendous uh. amount of King Tut uh, paraphernalia and memorabilia in the news. Mm -hmm. I guess because it was the 100th anniversary of the discovery of King Tut's tomb. I think that's what it was, yeah. You know, what a lot of, a, a lot of contemporary folks don't understand is that the, um, the discovery of uh, King uh, Tutankhamun's tomb... Oh, pardon me. Uh, I, did, I, didn't mean to, I didn't mean to intimate any sort of familiarization that I could have referred to him by his nickname. I'm sorry. Oh. <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> It's okay. We call him. Everybody calls him Tut. It's interesting that in in the 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 nineteen twenties, a uh, uh, a wave of uh, not hysteria, but um, oh, what's the word? You know, when I was a kid, there was a Davy Crockett, uh, you know, kind of uh, fad. We don't call it huh, fad. I'm sorry, that's the word fad. Okay. Well, when when King Tut was found. There was this this fad that swept the uh, the Western world. I mean, it was a craze. Everything Egyptian suddenly be became very very popular. So he he caught the imagination of people, and I think it even raised a lot of interest in Egyptology, uh, principally his his discovery. So for but, those uh, listeners that are just joining us, maybe now they might, this might be their their first occasion to tune into our podcast. I want to reintroduce my colleague, Jim Long, uh, that he is a noted, world-renowned Egyptologist, filmmaker, I, I, <laughs> novelist. Well, thank you for that. I'm more of a filmmaker than I am an Egyptologist, but uh, and I will of say course, that I... You're also the only person in, in, uh, that I know that really understands the music of the 60s and 70s because of your glorious past as a DJ. But well, as far as Egyptology yeah. is concerned, yeah, I I have a I've had a lifelong interest in it, spurned uh, on by uh, seeing the Ten Commandments from Cecil B. DeMille when I was ten years of age, and so that uh, I finally got to Egypt a few years ago and and have made uh, ten trips to Egypt uh, thanks to the graciousness of our Creator. And uh, hope to return again when it's normal, whatever that is. And so then, of course, you, you have your beautiful documentary film, The Riddle of the Exodus, which actually can be seen on the Jerusalem Lights YouTube channel. Right. So some of the headlines that I've been seeing the past couple of days about King Tut um, is that there have been some new finds. A uh, hundred mm -hmm. years after unearthing the the, uh, the tomb, there have been some new finds, and they've been talking about new controversies, unearthing new artifacts, talking about uh, things that have been stolen. Um, then there's an inter an interest in this whole thing about how um, uh, after it was discovered in 1922, word spread of a curse that was yes. plaguing and sometimes killing all those who entered it. And that became like a whole meme in, in, in Hollywood, the whole idea of uh, the mm -hmm. mummy's curse and, and everything like that. And then here's the best headline of all in my Google feed. It says, King Tutankhamun, latest news, breaking stories, I'd comment. And you figure a guy like that after not just 100 years, but a long time before that, he's still, he's still making headlines. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, the my favorite recent headline is not really so recent, but it, it was in the last few years. Is was the guy cleaning the uh, the king, the famous King Tut's headpiece, and he broke the fake beard off. You know, the 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 pharaohs wore fake beards. And also, wasn't he like really like a lad? He was a very young man. He was a lad. He I think he was a teenager. Right. But uh, the famous King Tut mask, the the desk mask that was on the sarcophagus that's on display. I've seen it in the museum in Cairo. It, the, it's, it has the fake beard 
uh, and and so the guy cleaning it broke it off and tried to <laughs> to glue it back on. That happened some years ago, and that was the that was the controversy that I most remember of recent times. But I'm not that interested in King Tut, by the way. Okay, I'm really not because he's he to me he's sort of a little late in the Egyptian timeline for me to be interested because he's nowhere near. He's so much. He's so many centuries after the Exodus that I don't really have that much interest in him. And this topic will gain a lot more um, uh, centrality for us in our conversations as we move closer towards those Torah portions in a couple of weeks, really. But actually, right now, um, not at all would I say it in the same breath of what I want to mention now as far as the King Tut is concerned. He, he, that's the deal with him. Now I, I want to move on and and I want to mention that this past Shabbat, which was, I believe, November 5th, this past Shabbat, which was the Sabbath in which we read the Torah portion of Lech Lecha. So before our podcast last week, I, I neglected to mention that it was the yard site, the Yom Hashanah, the anniversary of the pastoring of our matriarch, Rachel. And... In Israel, the 11th day of the month of Marcheshvan, the passing of Rachel, is a very big deal. We're in <clears throat> thousands and thousands of people go and pray at her tomb, which is just at the very beginning of, of uh, Bethlehem, as we read in the, in the Torah, when she died along the way, giving birth to Benjamin, and Yaakov buried her before he was able to get to Hebron, which of course is where the tomb of the patriarchs is. And the significance of Rachel being buried there in Bethlehem is is staggering for many reasons in 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 Torah literature. The thing is, though, that um, it's just a whole powerful idea. That day here in in Israel, uh, it's you know she is associated with a powerful uh, prayer before Hashem, and I, I want to talk about that. And also, you know, personally, like the one of the strongest spiritual experiences that I ever had many many years ago when I was quite young was there at the tomb of Rachel. It's a, it's a very, very moving place. And um, the interesting thing is that, so the 11th of Mar Cheshvan, the day of her passing this, this year, was this past Shabbat, November 5th, which was the day in which we read the Torah portion of Lech Lecha, beginning in Genesis chapter 12. And actually, that was like an intersect, like that Torah portion being read the very same day of her passing, although she, of course, she doesn't figure in that Torah portion. She hasn't appeared yet on no. the scene. But yet, actually, in fact, every year, the 11th of Mar Hashvan usually falls out somewhere in the juxtaposition with Shabbat Lech Lecha, but the, this year was the same day. What's the point? There is a very strong commonality between Avraham Avinu and Rachel. They share something, in two things that I'm thinking of, really. Very, very powerful kind of um, shared lesson that we get from, from both Rachel and, and Ivan. By the way, I, I want to mention also, before I forget, going to the tomb of... Have you been to the tomb of Rachel lately? No, I have not. I, I think the last tomb I visited in Eretz Israel was up at um, Tiberia, when I went to the site, it's right there in town that is supposed to be the tomb of several other of the matriarchs. Yes. And uh, some of uh, well, the other... Well, in the center of Tiberias, there's like a beautiful park, and that's where actually the Rambam is there, Maimonides. Right, exactly. And many of the early sages. Um, mm -hmm. But have you ever been to Rachel's tomb? No, I have not. Oh wow! Not, so I have to I, 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 make sure that you yeah. that you get there. It's just a very powerful spiritual feeling. They're really overwhelming. But what I wanted to say is that the experience has changed so much since Oslo, since the since the beginning of uh, what they call a Palestinian um, authority uh, rule in in that area. Um, years and years ago, I remember actually walking to Rachel's tomb from, from Jerusalem, from the southernmost neighborhood, Gilo. And now, um, basically, because Bethlehem was given to the Palestinians, but Rachel's tomb is a, is a precious um, 
place of pilgrimage for the Jewish people, and it's kind of at the outskirts of the of the city. So safe pass safe passage has to be guaranteed for the Jewish pilgrims who want to go to Rachel's tomb to pray. Because why do I say safe passage? Because Jews who venture near the so-called Palestinian territories are taking their lives in their hands. That's these peace partners that we right. have. They're just constantly. Uh, opening fire, whether it's Molotov cocktails or rocks or actual <laughs> gunfire, and it's it's quite quite something. So, Rachel's tomb is now like it's become this fortress, and it is like contained in like a concrete sleeve that kind of like is like an uh, an abutment from the Palestinian controlled Bethlehem. It's it's chilling. It's um, the feeling of pathos is very powerful because she's basically like in prison. She is literally in prison. In order to get to Rachel's tomb now, you have to have a military uh, convoy. You have to. You can take your car only so far. Then you have to park, and then you have to be uh, accompanied by a military vehicle in a bus, and you go through this. Just it's like a. It's I don't know how to describe it. It's this huge concrete tunnel topped with barbed wire and and the military um, watchtowers everywhere. And even so, and, 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 it's, and, it's, and they, they took this beautiful historic building. I'm sure you've seen it, it depicted. It's a, it's a very evocative scene, uh, Rachel's tomb. It's, and it's been depicted in like uh, paintings <clears throat> throughout the centuries and hasn't changed yet, except that now the whole thing is within this kind of like a concrete world. And even so, they they still find places from which to open fire on the, on the Jews who go and visit there occasionally. I don't want to make yeah. it sound like it's not well, the thing what, to do. Well, what you've described is the reason that I have never been there. I I you know uh, I had I had to arrange a special trip the couple of two or three times I've been to Hebron. Right. Because you know you shouldn't go by there by yourself, but it's I think a little we've been there safer. Together. We've done that together. I've done that, but I, I never could. I never found the opportunity to get someone to go with me. I to will Rachel's make sure tomb. that we we must remedy that as as soon as possible. Yeah. It's just it's such a very very moving experience. And and now I want to talk about why, a little bit why okay. why why Rachel is so important. And again, we'll be reading about her only in another few weeks. But again, because of this past Shabbat and the confluence with something in common with Abraham is really what I wanted to talk about. So if I ask you, off the cuff. The question, what, it, what, is, what comes to mind when I pose the question, well, what did Rachel, the matriarch, have in common with Avraham? What would you hazard as a guess? I, right off the top of my head, I would say uh, that apparently, uh, since Rachel was so incredibly beautiful, Avraham must have been quite handsome. I'm, I digress. No. Would it be their kindness? Would it be their, their, their chesed? So that is actually, you have, you have already skipped the first stage that I wanted to talk about it because you're so smart and you're so handsome, <laughs> et cetera, oh. et cetera, that you actually, you, that's, that is what, yes, that is something very powerful. Let me get to that in a moment. That's actually sure. the main thing I wanted to say. But before that, I think there is something very basic. That, like the first thing that comes to my mind is that both of them have a similar background. Their parents, their fathers were idolaters. Yes. Very right. Good, so now yeah. what, what is really compelling that they could have stayed where they were. They could have stayed put. They uh, could have stayed with what they were born into. They could have been complacent. Nobody would have found them guilty of, of anything, of any sloth, slothful behavior had they, had they just remained who they were born to be. And they you know, certainly were expected... And that way, they could certainly have been politically correct. They could have avoided a tremendous amount of friction with their families. But each one of them, in their own way, Abraham and Rachel, were responsible for blazing a whole new trail and changing the world and building the nation of Israel for the sake of the world. And so from both of them, I think we learned that. And they both stepped incredibly outside their comfort zone. And I think that, you know, if you really want to take a step for Hashem, you have to exhibit this faith and courage and go out on your own. And it's not a simple thing. Not everybody can do that, you know, to take that kind of a step. But that's one thing that I think we learned from both of them, that they 
it's like they heard Hashem calling them, like an inner voice, both of them. Because if we are just complacent, then we're not gonna we're not gonna get anywhere. Look at Abraham. The very first thing in the in the parsha last week in Lech Lecha, is Hashem is telling him to to move, you know, to get out, to go Lech Lecha, go for yourself or go into yourself, a journey of self knowledge. Discover who you can be, who you really are. So you have to advance all the time. You can never become complacent, and that's the story of our lives. Like Hashem is beckoning to us all the time to go against the stream not to settle for any sort of, of uh, compromise on what we believe and what we know to be true. So that's the first, the first thing. But the second thing, which I think is a much deeper connection, is exactly what you said. And that is they, they share a certain propensity for this all-powerful quality of chesed, of kindness, which is the most important quality that a person can have. And a lot of people think they probably have heard this before and understand it, but it's really much, much deeper than we can just, you know, <clears throat> summarize um, just by saying, oh, yes, uh, he was a man of kindness, and yes, she, she was kind. It's, it's much, much deeper than that. Of course, everybody knows that when we talk about Avraham, he is like synonymous with chesed. I, I mentioned this last week in our, in our video, and I tried to make some one point very, very clear and I don't know if it, I succeeded or not, so I'll just repeat it now because it's such a beautiful idea. You, you know that Avraham represents chesed, right? I mean, it's a famous, famous idea. His whole life was bestowing acts of loving kindness, as we're going to see in the in the most uh, in the most um, riveting way now in the beginning of chapter eighteen and in this week's Torah portion of of Ayer, And I, I want to talk more about because incredible acts of selfless, selflessness and where it got him. But the thing is, you know, he is credited with being the first person who discovered Hashem, right? Who revealed that there's only one creator in this tremendous vacuum in which there was absolutely no understanding whatsoever. Why it's so is another issue, how these generations went by and the tradition from Adam from the first man was lost and so and then Noah and then the world wasn't so much better after the flood because there was still the tower and all that business and then Abraham comes along and he goes through what he goes through which was also like this incredible journey of knowledge to find out that there's only one creator but it, but the sages describe it in the most beautiful way that the way he figured it out was by contemplating the world Right. And, by, and by really considering nature and how the world works and how perfect it is and how beautiful it is. And he came to the conclusion by examining the world that there has to be someone in charge here, that there has to be what he, what he called the master of the house. Why? Because he detected that the basis of all creation is kindness, that Hashem created the world in, in kindness. And this is just so huge because it's it's um, Psalms 89, which by the way, it, it's it's the character introduced in the beginning of Psalms 89 is called Eitan HaEzrachi, which literally means Eitan the citizen. And Eitan is a world is a word that means like like uh, steadfast, like uh, unshakable, and that is actually a, a, King David is using that as a code for. Avraham and calling him the citizen because he was like the first citizen of the world because he's the first person who wanted to take responsibility for all humanity. So there in, we have a, a verse there in um, uh, Psalm 89. The world is built on kindness. Olam chesed yibaneh. Which means basically that and Avraham is the speaker saying like he perceived that Hashem created the world with kindness and for the purpose of kindness, for bestowing kindness upon man. And then, for example, we have we have this verse in Psalms 52, verse 3, chesed el kol hayom, that the kindness of Hashem is all day long. So the, so the beautiful idea there is that this is why Avraham became, like, if I may say, just obsessed with kindness so that he, he didn't know any other way. Like his whole thing, we're going to see it just in a moment. I want to talk about the beginning of this week's Torah portion, but like, he just exuded kindness, like he couldn't live without it. It was actually for him life or death. Because as you know, like one of the highest 
goals in the in the Torah experience for the Torah personality is to emulate God. And so the way Avraham emulated him was through Chesed, because that's how he knew God, because that's how he discovered him in the first place. So he he this is what he knew, this is what he saw, and so therefore he naturally gravitated towards that side of behavior because he realized that the whole purpose of creation is is chesed. And that is one of the deepest things that we learn in the beginning of this week's Torah portion, which is this is unbelievable beginning. And again, when, you know, the, the, the uh, connection between the written Torah and the oral Torah is so inexorable because the backstory of Genesis 18 uh, is that Hashem is visiting Avraham because Hashem is basically fulfilling the commandment of visiting the sick. Because Avraham is on the third day after his self-operation, his circumcision, right? He's 99 years old, and he circumcised himself at the end of last week's Torah portion, and the third day is the most painful. So Avraham is sitting, and Hashem loves Avraham so much, and he knew that Avraham is so obsessive compulsive about hospitality because Avraham pitched his tent at a crossroads of four different directions and it was open on all four sides because he must see if there's anybody coming so that he could run out to that person and give them a meal and to entertain them with hospitality because that to him was imitating Hashem. Mm -hmm. He pursued he pursued kindness right. and hospitality. I mean, it's it's and and what's uh, what's interesting is the how close the words for justice and kindness are together linguistically. Right. They are to to people. What this I think teaches us at the very beginning of this parsha is the fact that to pursue justice is to is to be kind. Uh, you know the saying that we know from the sages that if you are uh, if you're kind to the cruel. The the uh, I always get this. Mixed you'll up. end up I, being I you'll, if, you, if you're cruel to if you're kind to the to the uh, if you're merciful to the cruel you'll end up being cruel to the merciful. Exactly. Regarding, and for example, I, King I, Saul and King and, and Agag. Yeah, and I think it's it's uh, important to remind everybody that you know, like you said, the difference between between Avraham as we call him Avraham Avino, our, our father is that it wasn't that there was no knowledge of Hashem in the world in, in, in Abraham's day when he was growing up. It was the different because I mean Noah and Shem were still alive, but they were but the, the problem is they were living off they were almost in hiding. And so they weren't out proclaiming the name of Hashem. And the, the difference the, the stark difference is that uh, to not to put too fine a point on it, is that Abraham grew up all on his own without he, he later was instructed at at, at the the table of, of Shem and, and Noah. He met these men and even learned from them and we're told that when he came out of hiding from because because Nimrod wanted to kill him because of because of his perceived effrontery to the gods of, of ancient Bavel and of course the prophecy that someone in Avraham's family would bring Nimrod down. I mean, there were all kinds of reasons that Nimrod wanted this this guy out of the picture. So after he came in, and don't the sages tell us that at a very young age, he came to this idea that there is one creator who through his kindness to his creation. And then so uh, Avraham is the one that took up that sort of uh, banner and, and waved it in front of the world and became an active promoter of the idea of of this uh, not only this per, this this entity this this supernal being that created humanity but of the love that he bestowed on humanity and I love the story about when he later goes to to uh, to learn with uh, Shem and Noah and Aver that when he hears the story about all of the work that Noah did on the ark to make sure to make sure that the animals were fed and even fed before his family sat down, that uh, the, the kindness he showed towards the animals, Avraham wreathed within himself. How much kinder can I should I be towards my fellow man 
if if Noah was so kind to a, a, a dumb animal. And so I, I think that's the, the stark difference is between those two. You know, a lot of people uh, through the years, uh, Rabbi, have asked me, they've said, well, who is your role model as, as a Noahide? They say, is... is uh, is Noah your, your role model? And I said, in some ways, but no, my role model has always been Avraham because Avraham was the best Noahide you could be before he became the progenitor of, of the people of, uh, that eventually became the nation of Israel. So, and we can see that in this coming tour, in this week's Torah Parsha, how kindness actually factored into uh one of the main events that we're going to be talking about i think so he he's sitting in his tent right in 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 genesis 18 and um there's this whole unbelievable backstory when these angels come mm -hmm. that and the the backstory is that he's sitting there and the verse says that he's sitting there in the heat of the day but the truth is that the, that that's the way it's translated because the, you know translations sometimes have to make something readable. But in Hebrew, it, it actually uses this letter kaf ki chomayom. It was like the heat of the day, and so the sages have a whole idea that the the heat on that day was so intense it was like manufactured. It was artificial because because God was so concerned that Abraham should not have to. Um, be bothered with wayfarers that he made it exceptionally hot that day because he didn't, because he, he was suffering, you know, he was in a lot of pain. It was the old man, the third day after his circumcision. And God knew that if there would be people outside that Abraham would run after them to make a meal for them. So he, he, the expression that Rashi uses is that he took the sun out of its sheath and he made it like super hot. So Abraham would not be bothered. So God, as it were, changed nature for his friend Abraham, you know, to make it easier for him. But then God actually had to change nature again because he saw that the pain that he was suffering from not being able to, to do kindness to guests was greater than the physical pain. And so he sends these three men. And so Avram looks up and he sees them and he thinks that they're wayfarers, you know. And so he runs to make them a meal. And of course they had their missions. Each one had their own mission as far as the continuation of the of the parsha, but the idea is that you know the first words of the parsha are that Hashem appeared to him, and then all of a sudden in the next in the next verse he lifts up his eyes and he sees these men and he goes running after them, and we never hear another word about the fact that Hashem appeared to him. Meaning there was there's something very powerful going on here that God visited Abraham and they were talking, mm -hmm. and then Abraham like leaves him he drops him like he leaves the phone dangling <laughs> the cord for those just, of us who remember just hold a minute Hashem I've got something I've got to do I've got to help some people right here. right and you then know, he, yeah, and then he doesn't like, go back to that conversation whatever it was and, yeah. and it's and on the basis of this incredible idea the sages say that that hospitality to guests is greater than receiving the Shekhinah because that's exactly what happened here. He left the Shekhinah, as it were. He left the Divine Presence to go and, and attend to these, to these people. I, I like to put it in a way that I think is, is, is very um, expressive. It's like, it's like he was saying to Hashem, like, I don't have time to talk to you. I have to be like you. I don't have time to be with you. I have to be like you, which is, which is the true... Um, definition in a, in a Torah mindset of a religious experience. The other thing is that, as you know, uh, he goes and he runs after these cattle, right? <laughs> he's like, if you picture it, like he's hobbling, he's 99 years old, he just had a rather painful, rather painful operation. And then, then Abraham ran to the cattle, right? So there is a very powerful tradition uh, that I know you're aware of in, in the words of our sages that, that one of the calves ran and Avraham ran after it and it ran into a cave. And Avraham runs cave into the was. cave to, to uh, don't forget where he lives, he runs into this cave mm -hmm. to, to fetch this calf and runs into the, ca into the cave and he discovers the entrance to the Garden of Eden, Amen. which is underneath the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron. That's another whole 
podcast, but the point is, how, and how did he know that that's what it was? Because he sees Adam and Eve lying there in repose, and so and he knew that this is the place that he wants to be buried, and he knew that this was the Garden of Eden. So make a very, very long story very, very short, because this is like an incredible idea, but the bottom line is he discovered the entrance to paradise chasing after this little calf, meaning that the road to Gan Eden was literally paved with chesed, because he was... Yeah. In other words, that is the way... Uh, if I just want to translate this into what... Where the message that is being broadcast to us is that the way to paradise is through simple acts of kindness. Mm -hmm. It's just an That's unbelievable right. it thought. Turned, it, it turns the old saying on its head. You know, the old saying uh, is uh, the road to hell is paved with good intentions. <laughs> I was hoping we no, could leave that out, but okay. No, but no, but in reality, the road to to paradise is paved with good intentions. Right. That's that's exactly. the reality of that. It turns it on its head, you know. And I, what's interesting about this whole this whole narrative is the fact that you know here is Avraham who is who doesn't need to do this. He has he has people that work for him. That he has servants, and any of them could gone. He could have let them carry it out. But as you're pointing out, he was so intent on doing the, the right thing and making sure it was the best of the breed. He just basically ignored the help, uh, uh, you know, in his community that were there and ran after. And there's this, I ran into this this uh, amazing detail, and he said that uh, the sages tell us that they he sorted out three calves, and the reason was that, and I, and I can't figure out where this is going, because I read the commentary, and it's just I, this odd detail. Should I, should he, I he fill it for you? Is it about the tongue? Yes. So, okay. so because this, the question <laughs> is... The question is, why three? Why three calves? Yeah. For what, each one Could is going to eat a, them with one. Each one is going to eat yeah. a calf. So the, it must be that there was something singular about each one, a delicacy, and that he needed three. And what is it? There's only one thing. It's tongue. Mm. But Rashi yeah. says he was going to serve it to them with mustard. Yes. How does mustard. he know that? How does he know that? <laughs> right. And the how only answer he? is, how else does one eat tongue, a tongue sandwich without mustard? Yeah, <laughs> exactly. But of course, I'm not a meat eater, so I'm just giving that over to you. But, you know, yeah. that's for those that eat deli, you know. I just thought that was a, a very interesting uh, detail to bring out in the story. And I, I, could, not, I could not fathom why. <laughs> I, I guess because I've never eaten tongue. Maybe that's the... <laughs> so, anyway. Well, well, don't feel bad about that, Jim. Okay. Don't feel bad. About it. But right. of course, if you would have been one of Abraham's angels, you would have had to fake it that you were eating the tongue. Yeah. But anyway, um, so so here here is this thing. If I if you want me to continue with this, with your permission, here is here is the thing because I I started to mention Rachel, mm -hmm. and I mentioned the commonality between Abraham and Rachel, which is a, a powerful lesson for us that I that you know has a very strong message for us now that's but what I'd like to get to but in addition to the fact that they that they had this similar idolatrous background and that they chose to overcome and they chose to go out on their own and they chose something else and they chose not to remain and to use the excuse of being just this is how I was born and I'm going to go through the motions but they chose to listen to the inner voice instead there's something else and that is the side of chesed as you pointed out immediately when I asked you the question so we know about Avraham. We see from the beginning of this parsha this almost unspeakable devotion to kindness to others at his own personal expense and, the, and how it literally, metaphorically, but literally, Torah is teaching us that it literally led him into Gan Eden, his desire to do chesed. Rachel is the same way, and it's unsung. It's unsung, and it's a, a very, very remarkable idea that uh, I know many people are not aware of. And, and um, basically, I shared this very recently in one of our Zoom classes. I, I had occasion to share it. And basically, it goes to um, a little bit further from now in Parshat Vayetze, in, in, uh, when Yaakov met Rachel. And he starts mm -hmm. to work for his father-in-law, Lavan, uh, for her hand in marriage in Genesis 29. And as everybody knows, Lavan was a, 
um, gangster, and yeah. he he made a switch. He made a switch that that uh, that Yaakov apparently was not aware of. The reason he was not aware of it, and because it says, you know, it was, and it, and it's it's Genesis twenty nine and verse twenty five, and it was in the morning that behold, it was Leah. So why didn't he know about it during the night, the bridal nights, right? So you know, there's a whole idea here about modesty between couples and Torah law and, and darkness, but there's much more to it than that. So the idea is, it's very, very deep, that Rachel knew her father. Rachel knew her father, and Yaakov knew who Lavan was, and they suspected that he might try something like this. And so they made up between them a code. Mm -hmm. And the code was a certain signal that Rachel was going to give Yaakov so that he would know that it was really her. Because they, they, they thought that he might try to pull something like this, right? At the very last minute, this is, again, a, an amazing lesson, right? At the very last minute, Rachel felt badly for her older sister that she should not be embarrassed. And she decided that she would give over these, this code to Leah. Right. And so, actually, uh, Leah did the code. It wasn't a spoken word. It was a, it was a gesture, a physical it gesture. A, I think right? it was a tugging of the ear or something. Another time. So, okay. so anyway, <laughs> he, so she, he, it took me 50 years to, to, to find what that, what that code was. It's obscure. So anyway, so she did it. So Yaakov thinks that it's, that it's Leah, right? But more than that, more than that, the sages say that Rachel actually positioned herself under the bed that night so that when Yaakov spoke to Leah, she answered and he heard her voice and he really thought that it was her. It's very complicated for other reasons, but bear with me for a, a moment. So that's what she did. And, and um, it's, quite, it's quite remarkable, right? On, on, yeah. At face value, the way we're, the way we're giving it over, it's, it's quite... It's quite unusual. So indeed, there is a midrash that talks about the, the, the time of the destruction of the, of the temple, that the decree that had been made against the people of Israel was very severe, but it was going to be even more severe. And at that time, um, the forefathers all came out of, uh, of their tombs and, 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 and uh, asked for uh, mercy for their children and... Shabbat itself came, and the Torah itself came, and the letters of the Alphabet came, and every, everyone came. All these entities came. Again, it's a, it's a parable, and they all beseeched Hashem for mercy, and he didn't listen to any of them, right? And then the Midrash ends by saying, and then Rachel jumped up, and she said the following. She said, Master of the Universe, and she told over the story of what she did, and she said, I wasn't jealous in the least bit of my, of my sister. You that you're the, the, the king of kings, that you are the master of the universe, you're jealous of the children of Israel, that they backslid and they worshipped idols temporarily and they, they got disconnected. And there's nothing to that. There's nothing to idols. There's, it's nothing. So why should you be jealous if I, if I, flesh and blood, could overcome my jealousy? Can't you overcome your jealousy? And then Hashem said, wow, I'm bested. You bested me. And in, and in your merit, the children of Israel will return to their borders, all because of this unbelievable kindness that you did. And that is the secret of the verses that we read in Jeremiah 31, where we read, Thus said Hashem, a voice is heard on high, wailing, bitter, whipping, bitter weeping. Rachel weeps for her children. She refuses to be consoled for her children, for they are gone. Thus said Hashem, Restrain your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears, for there is reward for your accomplishment. The word of Hashem, and they will return from the enemy's land. There is hope for your future, the word of Hashem, and your children will return to their border. What is the reward for your accomplishment? It's referring to this particular story that she, that she did, this act of selflessness that she did for her sister. So from both Avraham and Rachel, we see that chesed, kindness, is absolutely the, the foundation of the world. It's not just like another, another aspect of a fine person, like to be good to other people. It's everything. It's really everything. And by the way, 
chesed is one of the Noahide laws. And even though it doesn't appear to be, and I'll tell you how, because you and I were talking about this, I think, before we began the program today, you mentioned early on the, the, the um, connection between uh, kindness and justice, right? Between chesed and, right. and, 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 the, and the positive commandment to establish courts of justice and to pursue justice. Uh, the way I understand it, therefore, kindness is a, is a direct offshoot of the imperative on all Noahites to see to it that the world is administered with justice because there can't be justice without promoting and pursuing kindness for everyone. Right. Well, this is, uh, I, I hope I'm not jumping ahead. This is, this is the reason that uh, the whole episode of Sodom and Gomorrah comes up in this Parsha. Because Avraham Avinu, he begins the, the, the Torah Parsha with these acts of, of selfless kindness to these strangers. And his acts of kindness are in complete contradistinction to what's going on down in Sodom and Gomorrah. And they were judged. They weren't, you know, people, all, you know, in today's vernacular, we always think about Sodom and Gomorrah. Some, you know, someone says, I've been there. If you've been to Vegas, that's a regular Sodom and Gomorrah. And they're, they're actually talking more about the sexual nature of the sins of Sodom. But this never comes up in, in the, the idea that, that these angels were sent to destroy the, these five cities of the plain. It's because they had completely rejected kindness. I'm so glad that you're saying that because that is such a... I was just talking about this today with the situation. Uh, <laughs> the thing is that in Sodom, they had laws. You know, like like you yeah. are, you're you're fond of talking about the the code of uh, what's his name again, Hammurabi. Right, how people talk yeah. about oh the code of Hammurabi that was like the first uh, la civilized society like laws. There were horrible laws though. They were horrible, horrible. cruel yeah. laws. So the thing Very. about Sodom, like you said, in addition to the sexual depravity, which is a recurring theme as we we keep finding throughout uh, Genesis that mankind has a, a proclivity towards sliding down that slope. But in Sodom, they had laws. It was, a, it was a society that was based on their take on uh, justice. So, uh, for example, there's a, and this, the sages, again, they're in their, in their um, incredible midrash, uh, you know, it's always so piercing and so, and so um, jarring, you know, the, the examples that they give. So there's a, a concept about Sodom, it's called the bed of Sodom. Yes. So they had hospitality there, right? <laughs> had a bed and breakfast, Airbnb, right? But they had only one size of this bed. And the Midrash says that their guest would come, and this is the bed. And either it fits him, or his legs are too long. If his legs are too long, they chopped off his legs. And if he didn't, if he didn't meet between the headboard and the footboard, they stretched him, right? So that is like what Sodom was. But they had all sorts of rules. Like, for example... Um, there's another uh, incredible insight of our sages that talks about why is it that when it came time for Lot's wife to be punished, that she was turned into a pillar of salt. Yeah. Why salt, right? And so there's a, a statement that when, uh, when, when the angels came to Lot, the guests came, right? He wanted to offer them salt with their meal. And she said, oh, you, you, you also brought that miserable, wretched custom here to offer a guest salt with their meal, right? So because of that, because she was like, she was like, uh, what is the word in English? Like a miserly uh, in, in not wanting to give salt, she turned into a pillar of salt. So like everything was like a huge, um, um, what, do, what do you call it? Like a, a, like a um, inversion of... Mm -hmm. Of, of everything good, of propriety, of dignity, of, of caring yeah. about another person. It was, it was all, it was like a mockery, like a parody, like a netherworld, like a dystopian vision, a, a, an inverted vision of what everything should be. That's, that was their everyday norm in Sodom. Mm -hmm. They'd outlawed charity. Yes, exactly. You could not, if, if, a, if a stranger came that was not part of the community, if a stranger came to town, it was forbidden to give them lodging or to feed them. And the uh, there is a, a a source called Sefer HaYashar, which you know I'm I'm, I'm uh, fond of, of quoting because it's 
It's mentioned twice in the Tanakh in 2 Samuel 1.18 and Joshua 10.13. 10, it says, have you not read this in Sefer HaYashar? There is an account in there that what really sealed the fate of Sodom and Gomorrah was when a traveler came to town, no one would feed him, no one would give him lodging, and the youngest daughter of Lot went out, would sneak out in the nighttime and feed this poor soul. And, <clears throat> excuse me, she was caught and they tortured her to death. This is this is how for wanting know, to for wanting to take care of her, to, for, I guess, to, right. to, to show kindness. She was put to death, and that's when um, the, the the narrative in Sefer Yashar says that that the uh, the angels sort of cried out to Hashem and said, "Look at this. They, they have." And so this was this sealed their fate. Was this? And I was I was trying to find the uh, the the reference to. The nations, but you know, like you said, I mean, maybe I'm putting too fine a point on it. You know that the fact that that courts of justice, the the other side or additional aspect to that, as you just pointed out, is to uh, to almost to to uh, um, to practice kindness right. to, to make it. Again, if, the, if, in, if we believe that that's the foundation of creation, that's what make the war, makes the yeah. world go wrong. That should be the purpose of. Seeing to it that 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 justice is administered, but but the but the um, again like the negative image of that is when you have a society that's very organized and very structured and has all these laws, but it's all basically geared towards um, um, exploitation of of other people, right? You yeah, know where, you know where yeah. we're going with this because it's like sure. there's so much of this that sounds like you know like a, like a um, you know, like an exaggeration, like some sort of like some sort of of horrible, fan, fantastical, you know, fictional depiction of, of of dystopian society. And such things have been written already. We know, but the fact is that there's a lot of aspects of our society, Western society today, that seems to be going in this direction. Yeah, I, I was going to uh, the Ramban with an N. Ramban writes that uh, Zedaka. Uh, Charity, kindness, uh, exalts any individual or a nation that practices it. And and he also writes later on and says the story of Saddam uh, that appears in, in Brashit, in his commentary, he points out that the root cause of the destruction of the cities was described by the prophet Ezekiel, who says, quote, uh, in 16... Uh, uh, for, verse 16, 49 and 50. Behold, this was the sin of Sodom, your sister. She and her daughters had pride and a surfeit of bread and peaceful serenity, but she did not strengthen the hand of the poor and the needy, and they were haughty, and they committed an abomination before me. So I removed them in accordance with what I saw. And so th there again strengthens the idea that, that uh, and, and also, by the way, just by virtue of the fact that these uh, they were held accountable to these laws because the Torah had not yet been given, and so they were the reason that they they had didn't have an excuse is because they must have known about the Noahide laws, and and the the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah obviously were no were were what you would call Noahide towns because any town would have been before the giving of the Torah. So they, the, their fate was sealed and the execution was carried out. And again, the kindness, as we're talking about, of, of, this, of the patriarch is he pled, even knowing that and knowing their wickedness, Avraham pleads for, their, for them to be spared. That's the thing, is that, is that you know, when we talk about kindness and we've, you know, with these examples that we've given are extreme, like what Rachel did and what Avraham was all about. So Torah sets the, the the you know the benchmark very very high, and expects us to strive to do our best to emulate them. But but the idea is that we cannot underestimate the importance of Chesed. It's not just like, yeah you know he's a nice guy he he tries to help out you know no it's that what we're actually supposed to be is so in love with Hashem, and so connected to each other that. We want to spread goodness 
to every creature, right? It means to every living creature, not just to friends and not just to human beings, and, and but to animals and to every and to, we just want to be a source of light and blessing and benevolence. We want to be imp making improvement and 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 make and aiding every level of existence that we come in contact with. That's a person of, of kindness, right? So again, uh, Psalms 89, the world is based on kindness, and Psalms 52, uh, the kindness of Hashem all day long. This is, this is the message, as a, as opposed to you know, and again, the, the, this week's Torah portion begins with Avraham running to take care of these people who he perceives as just simple wayfarers, and he discovers quite accidentally the entrance to paradise because he's so concerned with with making a meal for these people. And then we find, like you say, he's basically begging Hashem to find some uh, some merit, some redeeming social value in some of the citizenry of this of these wicked places, because he he is committed to to to, to humanity, to do his best for humanity. And in fact, this this beautiful verse, you know, when Hashem is basically um, getting ready for this. So he says, um, hold on. And Hashem said, shall I conceal from Avraham what I do? Now that Abraham is surely to become a great and mighty nation and all the nations of the earth shall bless themselves by him. For I have loved him because he commands his children and his household after him that they keep the way of Hashem doing charity and justice. So that is, that is like his whole job description. And Hashem is basically saying, since this is who you want to be, then you're my partner in the upkeep of the world. All of this to me is like um, boiling, boiling over in my mind because I look at the political landscape today. And I, I, I generally refrain from bringing up the political realities of the day as best as possible simply because I find it so distasteful and it's not my, uh, it's above my pay grade completely. Yeah. But the thing is, I think that we, that it behooves us to, to, uh, to mention um, that everything that we're describing here in terms of the, of the grooming of a person who is, is, um, you know, developing a, a certain fine sense of, of what's right and what's wrong and, and wanting to be of benefit to other people, wanting to be kind, wanting to bring people, you know, um, light and love and happiness. That's what kindness is all about. It's about, about, about a, a making an improvement in the world, right? All of that is like the very opposite of the um, manifestations of, of so many aspects of society today. And that is the, that is what is manifest in the political climate. When you look, for example, at the level to which political campaigns have sunk to, the mood, right? The, the, the disqualification, the cancellation of basically anybody that doesn't agree with what's been set by whatever, what, by whatever office, and then amplified by the media. And anybody that thinks and disagrees, anybody that, th that thinks differently and disagrees is basically totally canceled. There's no, there's no, there's no decency, no tolerance, no respect, you know, like th there's a whole story I was reading about in America about voter intimidation, right? About the so-called voter intimidation. The thing is, there's a whole group of people in America now that are being branded as being anti-democratic because their ideas are not what is considered to be acceptable now. So here in Israel, right? And I, I want to speak about this because I, I know that there are many of our viewers and listeners that are that are sincerely curious about what it all means, right? Because the headlines give you one story only, right? So here the, the big story is the victory of Netanyahu and what's being branded as the rise of the far right. Yes. So this, the rise of the far right is, is of tremendous concern to American Jews, to the American administration, talk about how like Netanyahu has mainstreamed radicals and how and, and people bemoaning the fact that the left is basically disintegrated completely. And so then you have you have also editorials and pundits and screaming headlines and politicians talking about how basically Israel is at the abyss. And it's a nightmare. How could this have happened? 
and we have to do everything in our power to stop it and all this sort of thing. But the fact is that the voter t- turnout was so high and the, the um, representation of, of the parties that were elected was so, was so great that this is obviously the will of the people, right? So you have someone like, like my old favorite, Thomas Friedman, <laughs> right? Oh. New, York Ti- New York Times senior columnist Thomas Friedman this is, this is the, the byline. He lamented the hard-line, hardline religious coalition that is likely to come to power in Israel. And in, in an op-ed in the New York Times on Friday, it was headlined, The Israel We Knew Is Gone. <laughs> you know that I have an old history with Thomas Friedman, a personal history. So in this, in this uh, article, he's basically bemoaning the return of Netanyahu, along with accomplices in the far-right religious Zionism party. And uh, what, what has Thomas Friedman done for Israel, and what business is it of his? I don't know. But that's another, another point. The point being, mm-hmm. again, I thought, at least this is how it was when I grew up, I thought that democracy means that people vote for who they want to vote for <laughs> and who they feel they identify with and who they trust and who, or at least who they would like to trust and who they, and what type of direction they would like to see. But today, it's like, uh, again, um, whatever whatever this new, um, you know, construction construct, this new new, uh, coalition that could be built in Israel represents, it doesn't fit the narrative of of the establishment, whether it's the American Jewish establishment, whether it's the American administration, because it's a certain brand of Jewish pride that doesn't fit, and it's and it's a threat because it is basically not what is, not what is, um, not not what's convenient, not the product that they that they want. So it's branded as far right. What is far right? As we're talking here about people who express. Um, Jewish sovereignty over the land of Israel and the hope that Jews should not be killed over, <laughs> over being Jews yeah. in their own land, that they should yeah. be able to build, that they should be able to be sovereign. And this is branded as like extremism and far, and far right. And we're supposed to buy that, those goods. We're supposed to understand, oh, there's something very, very wrong here. And everything is in the discourse. And in America as well, in the political climate, everything is nasty, demeaning, dehumanizing. And the press demonizes and doesn't report the news, but tells you no. what you should be thinking and what it means to them, and therefore it must be true. And this is, and, and this is uh, so, something that needs to be addressed because it is so the opposite of everything that we spent the first 55 minutes yeah. uh, speaking about today. And, here, and here's an administration that, it, that, that the people in this present administration that spent two years telling us that there was meddling in the American election process, and yet, by virtue of the fact that you're hearing the same talking points about conservatives in this country, you're hearing the very same thing in Israel, and it's like, wait a minute, hmm, maybe it's because of the Amer- this administration is meddling in the affairs of that, Israel. That's and exactly them- where I wanted to go, that there, there's all this yeah. talk about interference, right? Interference but the fact is that uh, America has threatened that they are not going to be able to work with yeah. the new Israeli government if Ben Gvir is, becomes a minister. Like, how dare we think that 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 a man with so-called far right um, uh, positions, which is again basically it's a brand of Jewish pride that many people find inconvenient because it's not apologetic, because it is not self-immolating, because it it involves actually standing up and and taking the, the our nation and our land to its destiny hopefully right or at least talking yeah. about it right well, keeping it keeping the nation alive exactly that's exactly you know exactly and so this is this is already like it, it's not that it's been in, intimated they've actually said that you know we're not gonna be able to work with them how dare you it's like right. so it's it's so ludicrous and so absurd but the, again this is what uh, has come to be to be to be accepted as the norm, you know, and it and it's based on again on the, on the total uprooting and and cancellation and and um, and trashing of the individual of 
of the, the basic civil democratic rights of a people. Again, and it's the same thing whether whether it's whether it's here or whether it's there. It's it's a, a monstrous device that has been set in motion, and the masses, you know, um, they can be like uh, uh, Rachel and Avraham were born into idolatrous families, and they could have just gone through the motions and not made their move. But if Hashem, you know, Hashem calls out to every person to stand up for the truth. And this is exactly the type of, of a precipice that we are standing over right now, exactly what they faced as well. They faced this wave of, of, um, con of, con of conformity, which was basically um, conformity to, to, the, to evil, to the norms of the day, to the norms of Sodom. That's exactly what it was. This is, this is why, <clears throat> excuse me, this is why Avraham Avinu is, is my personal model because he so perfectly balanced the ideas of justice and kindness, perfectly balanced them in, in, the, in the fact that he loved uh, justice as much as he loved mercy. And he knew you could not separate those two concepts. And we just, uh, we talked about that earlier. And that, that uh, to the point, in our last Torah Parsha, he takes up arms because his own, uh, nephew has been kidnapped by these foreign powers, and he's going to he's going to take this small force of men and and do the right thing. He's going to stand up and do the right thing because these people have have denied and overlooked the ideas of kindness to your neighbors and kidnapped people and taken the innocent away. And so that's what we have to do. We have to stand up and say, you know, uh, you know, we're standing up because we believe in kindness to one another. We don't believe in in demonizing, I mean, the sages tell us that, if I'm not mistaken, that the uh, uh, that um, uh, destroying someone's reputation is linked to the commandment against murder. Correct. Because because when you when you are when you destroy someone's reputation, you it, you it, you by connection you destroy their life, their Do livelihood. Any, any sort of defamation, character defamation, defamation, character uh, uh, character assassination, um, it's all a form of murder. But but yet the political uh, process today is based on that. It's right. Exactly. It, right. It's like yeah. it's not. It, the, the, if a party has nothing to run on except the fact that you should not be writing, running for, you should not be voting for that person, then something is really, mm -hmm. really wrong with the picture. If it's all yeah. based on just total demonization and and dehumanizing, demeaning, downright nasty. Yeah. That's that's what it's and, all about. And the, the the these powers that we're talking about are saying the same. I can't stress this enough, and you you brought this up that the same exact narrative is being used to besmirch the voters in this country who disagree with with uh, with Washington the same thing is being done to the pe to the voters in Israel who don't agree with the left over there and i'm sorry it looks like we're taking sides but you know what when there is when there is wrong in the world you have to take up the side of the right <laughs> and i don't that's, mean the right side of the equation that's clear that's clear i i am not um I'll believe it when I see it. You know, I'd like to see change. It's not for me. It's not a political issue. It's a question of life and death, and it's a question of who best can represent the true interests of of the Jewish people in their own land, and stand up for what's right. And so, again, it's I don't really trust any politician. I and we're really in Hashem's hands. But yet, you do your best in this world that we live in, to sure. uh, to 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 see to it that that. Uh, you know that we're doing our, our 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 best, right? And so when we hear this kind of talk about the rise of the far right, what we're really talking about is we're talking about people that have the audacity to 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 say, well, you know what? We have the right to live here without without being killed. We have the right to 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 be to be um, independent, and we have the right to be more than stable, but to be a thriving society, not dependent on 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 anyone else's uh, permission. And that's what irks apparently a lot of the powers that be, and mm -hmm. that's what it really all. And that's all boils that's down Israel's, to. yeah, that's Israel's right to uh, if if we're to believe what every what all the pundits over here say about democracy, Israel has has a right, uh, it has a duty. In fact, Israel has a duty to take its place in uh, among the nations, 
uh, as a sovereign nation apart from the, the meddling and the interference of other nations. That's what we're supposed what to show people. what happened to that whole idea that dem <coughs> democracy means that everybody votes according to their conscience and it's, it's the most basic thing in the world and it's everyone's basic right and it's to be respected and, and to be lauded. Whatever happened to that? Now it's like... There's something really, really wrong with you. You're dangerous. You're subversive. You are, you are practically a criminal if you disagree. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, the 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 which the is exactly what is, is, Nimrod's whole thing was as well. Exa exactly, exactly. He he and he he also told everybody. He said, "Let let let government take care of all your problems. Just I will take care of everything you do." And it takes away your self determination. And and uh, but. None of this is surprising, and and uh, I think a lot of us saw it coming. And you know, we're going to see what's going to happen in the midterms coming up this week, to see if this is going to be. I'm I'm so curious, and uh, a little concerned, and I'm not alone in this, as to whether uh, if if the uh, if a certain party wins more votes than than everybody says, gotcha. Then gotcha. Are they going to Are they going to scream? You know. Anyway, so we, we here in Israel, there. the people's will um, has been expressed. I think pretty pretty clearly. I think the yeah. wholesome, the wholesome uh, traditionalist um, people of Israel that stand for traditional values are sick and tired of being trampled on. Sick and sick and tired of seeing the things that are the most holy disrespected. And they are looking uh, for someone uh, that will take them to the next stage of the development of our history, leading to our destiny. To, to lead them on the, that, that road paved with, with good intentions and the, the outright of the, the, real, the real road really paved with good intentions. And, you know, you, the, your nation is supposed to lead the world one day in the idea of, of a nation that lives lives that believe and embrace the one true God. And, and, uh, and I always I, I, say to everyone that asks me, what does it mean, the chosen people? Because it's an inconvenient expression that some find very embarrassing and that some spend a lot of their lives avoiding, right? It doesn't mean like we're the best uh, doctors or lawyers or film producers. It means that Hashem chose the Jewish people to be the, the element in the world that bears witness throughout the whole saga of human history that there is a God in the world. The Jewish people, that's the verse in Isaiah, you are my witnesses. The Jewish people are the living proof, whether you like it or not, whether you like them or not, that there really is a God in the world. That is our purpose. And so that that's the purpose of, of, of the state of Israel as well. Whether it knows it or not, that ultimately is its purpose. Well, you know, the, 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 the Torah Parsha this week has, has the monumental teaching of the Akedah. And I know you're going to explore this much more in depth in one of your upcoming teachings for this Torah Parsha. But the one thing that I want to inject by the, the connection with our conversation right now is that when when the uh, the offering of Isaac begins to take place and, and Isaac is spared, and then the the ram is is put there in his place, one of the meanings that comes out of this episode, God tells Avraham that through you I will I will bless your offspring and your offspring, which is of course the nation of Israel. That's the culmination will bless the world and how will that how will that be done is by the rebuilding of the temple that will that will repeat that daily offering that represents the offering of Isaac and it's not the, it's not the burning up of a human being it is the life and the energy of of Isaac and his offspring in service to God and in service to humanity that's what those offerings represent and that's how that the Akedah, one of the things it represents is the idea that, that that your nation will be able to rebuild your temple, a house of prayer for all nations, and continue a daily offering that will do nothing but bless the world. I mean, that's that's what we that's what we would long for that, and that's that's what comes out of the Akedah, don't you think? I mean, you know. 
Let's wish our viewers and listeners a, a beautiful week. Let's all take the chesed challenge to look for opportunities for acts of kindness and always be willing to take that same stand that Rachel took and Avraham to step away from the tide of conformity, especially when it is against the will of Hashem, and to take a stand in this world for the one true God. Shalom, shalom. Amen.